Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Not too bad. Is this still the waiting room or is it the live room? This is the live room. Hi, live room. <laughs> this is my first ever Zoom conference, so I'm being a huge old about it. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, yeah, I heard you talking about why you build silly things. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's uh, I do this for a living now. It's really exciting. So that's what my yeah. talk is about. Yeah. All right. I'm excited to see this. Thank you. All right. Anyway. Should I, start? Should I yeah. just start? Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone on the internet. This is the strangest and mo most terrifying conference I've ever been to. I can't see you. So if you're all making fun of me, I can tell. Um, and this talk is going to be about silly things and the importance of building silly things. But first things first, I am Monica. This is me. This is my cat Neelix, and I have a dog hopper. So if you hear any barks around here, they're from her. I try to lock her out, and she's not a big, big fan about it. But um, they're they're part of the stock. And this is kind of my job now. I make silly things, and I keep saying this word silly, and I realize it sort of sounds really strange for you know a grown up to be saying that they make silly things. But to me, silly means something else than maybe what it means to you, because um, silly usually implies that you don't take things seriously or you think they're just like these hilarious random things and they're not. All of these things that I make are part of my life or part of my job even before I did it professionally. There were like things that I was really attached to. I put a lot of time into them. But I call them silly because when I do people take them a little bit less seriously. People get really stressed out when you say oh this is an art experiment because in society we've sort of been taught that we need to judge art we have opinions about art so when i say something is an art experiment people will put their judging hat on and be like is it really an art because i could also do this in my living room so instead i call them silly so that people can take them and enjoy them and make things with them and have a lot of fun this is one of the things that i made um it's called midi city 2000 and it literally makes cities out of songs so MIDI is this uh, abstract representation of music where basically you can represent every note that happens in a song. And it sort of like sounds like karaoke robotic music. It's not like the music that you hear on YouTube. But basically you have this like note representation where like at a particular time, a note will happen with a particular volume or velocity. But my favorite thing about MIDI is that if you think about it, it's this wonderful format to make art out of. So in MIDI CD 2000, I take all of these notes and I pretend that they're buildings. So there's different instruments in a MIDI song and they represent all of these rows of buildings that you can see. Um, and all of the actual buildings are the notes that happen in this song. So here we're looking at a real song and let's see what kind, which, which song it is. But the best thing about it is that it's also interactive. So if you think about notes in this way, you can start throwing away rows of buildings. You can spread apart or make uh, buildings closer together. And this gives you a different song. good song necessarily is just a song out there but it's kind of awesome because I built this and I didn't really meant it to be a weird musical instrument but it is a weird musical instrument because you can take something like Aladdin's A Whole New World um, best song to test anything with and then just sort of change it and get this like weird remix where you just threw away a bunch of notes and you can do the same thing by drawing a bunch of notes so these are the kind of things that I make and in particular, I make them because I want you to be able to make things with them. I don't like making things in a void where like you look at them and a little part of you doesn't become part of the process. I like things that force your creative process to exist, that Sorry. take your... Yeah? Sorry, um, are you pre um, screen sharing your presentation right now? Or oh my god, know? yes! <laughs> oh, you missed all of it. Hold on, I can do this. I can fix this. You should have interrupted me way before. I'm sorry. Oh, that's so sorry. Application window. Hold on, let me go and share yeah. um, from the beginning, just so you can see all of the... Can you now see it? Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, great. I'm going to go back in time and show you all the slides, and then I'll come back to this one and keep talking. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Cool. All right. Um, Kat? Dog, me, hi. Um, 
And then this was my city 3000. I'll give you the song again, just so you can see it, how, what was happening. And this is how we decrease sort of like we threw away some instruments, we threw away some of these buildings. Um, we space them out a little bit so that we get our different song. Cool. So that's made a pew, we did it. Um, right, so I make these things like this weird presentation where you're sort of part of it, but you're not really part of it, um, so that you can be part of these experiments. This is, but it took me a while to actually come to this conclusion because I made a lot of things that were sort of failed art experiments for me, like Emojilate. Um, this is one of the first things that I did about five years ago. And it's basically this application where you upload a photo of something, in this case, a taco, and it pixelates it and it converts every pixel to an emoji. And this is because I love emoji. I used to be obsessed with them uh, as a weird technical art form. And then this was fun because it's fun, you know, to like upload a photo of your face and see what emoji would get, you know, distributed all over your face. But the reason why this application, this was like a failed art experiment for me is because once I show you this emojilated taco and I ask you, what do you think um, this emojilated water bottle would look like? You kind of know what it's going to look like. You can sort of imagine what emoji would fit to what colors and what it would look like. So a lot of your ideas aren't really reflected in this application. I mean, sure, you upload the image, but it doesn't, you don't get to control really what comes out of it. Whereas with Midi City 2000, even though I showed you what Aladdin looks like, if I ask you, what do you think, I don't know, California Girls by Katy Perry looks like, you have no idea what sort of buildings that's going to create because you know the song, but you can't really separate it based on like buildings and when these notes actually happen. So I took this up and I was like, okay, great attempt. Let's try to do this again. And the way I fix this is by introducing rules. And the first thing I have to tell you about this slide is that I made these slides like half a year ago. I gave this talk like three times. And I have this crazy responsive font over here, the one that takes the rules and rotates it. And in the last Mac update, it has broken. So now random letters are sort of randomly capitalized and bright. And I was going to fix them. And then I was like, you know what? This is how the art process is. Sometimes you do things and they stop working because they're sort of fixed in time. So you have weird artifacts in this presentation and only in this presentation because I'm not giving it ever again. So the way I fixed my sort of like I was stuck in this this art area is by introducing rules. And this is a thing that artists do a lot. And it's a thing that I do as a programmer a lot because once you have a set of rules, like things that you can and cannot do, then that forces you to be super creative in a particular area. So for example, a lot of the things that I built and the reason why people know me as somebody who builds things with emoji is that for a long time, everything that I made had to contain emoji, had to produce something with emoji. And once you can figure out what this, what sort of like the visual aspect of what you're making is, then the things that I had to focus on were like, well, how can you interact with emoji? What, what are you trying to express through these emoji? Nowadays, I work on magenta, so all, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second, but now all I do is work with music. So this is why I work a lot with MIDI because that's the rule that I've introduced. Everything has to be about MIDI. So this is how I introduced the rule and the rule was again, do things with emoji. So the next thing that I built was called Emoji Garden, which is was incredibly fun to build, but incredibly silly and simple. Um, and it was wildly popular, but for the completely wrong reasons. So Emoji Garden is exactly what it says. It is a garden of emoji. Every time you refresh the page, you get a grid. You can change the grid size. You can have more animals or fewer animals or more leaves or fewer leaves, but that's it. That's all you get. You can't really contain, you can't really say something like, you know, a hamster once ate my family, so I would like to have no hamsters in this. Emoji Garden, tough cookies, you're going to get hamsters. Emoji Garden does whatever Emoji Garden wants. So again, this was a failed experiment for me because Again, if you wanted to like not have hamsters, I couldn't really control, let you control this. So there was no creative process for you to interact with this. But because of how I built this app and the tools that I used in this app, it became a sort of creative process in its own. So I built this app on Glitch. And if you don't know about Glitch, Glitch is one of my favorite things on the internet. It's this place that lets you write 
JavaScript and HTML and CSS and let you like host it and you can send the link to everybody really quickly. But in particular, it encourages people to remix it, it encourages people to take your code and do something with it. And to me, remixing is like the core idea around generative art because it has this like randomness to it where it's like I see what you've done and I like it and here's how I'm going to make it weird. So the moment I put Emoji Garden out there, sure people like looking at their gardens, but the thing that they liked the most about it is to make their own gardens. So here's a hedgehog garden where all of the animals are hedgehogs and they're the only things that are eating the snacks and it's got a whole bunch of cactuses. This is a desert which has a lot of really terrifying creatures in scorpions and fires. You can sometimes get a grid of like all fires. Here I have the fire is set to zero because it was terrifying. Uh, here's Emoji Sky where my friend who is a linguist, he's not a, she's not a programmer at all. She wanted to like build something where you could just look at skies and this is a gray San Francisco sky where I live. This is my favorite one that came out of this. This is called Emoji Voidscapes and I really only sometimes get it. It is dark and it is goth and it is weird and you get these like space black holes and sometimes you get incredibly ominous messages like the end is soon and weird eyeballs that pop out, out at you. And it's exactly the same code that made lovely hedgehogs eating mu mushrooms or whatever they were eating and I love it. This one's my favorite and this is when this happened I was like yes this is the kind of art I want to make. The kind of art that encourages people to make weird things with it. And the reason why this was so popular is because the way that I built Emoji Garden and the way the tools that I used really helped it become something else because the art itself wasn't generative. Emoji Garden was really boring statically, but because I built it on Glitch, a platform that encourages Remix and, and encourages people to like make things creatively in their own way, it sort of became generative art on its own. And this happens a lot with like anything that we build. We don't make art in a void. We don't write code in a void. The devices that we write this for, the tools that we write it for, are really going to shape the thing that you come out, the, the thing that you're going to produce. If you want to think about like static art, um, think of, I don't know, let's say Da Vinci, who was, you know, painting the Mona Lisa. Da Vinci, amazing with oil paints, uh, could paint anything out of oil paints. But if you took the oil paints away from him and only gave him like, socks and thumbtacks he wouldn't stop making art he was just made he would just made make make very different art it would look so much different but all of his creative ideas will still be there and will still be represented so this is why i think that picking tools that encourage you to be creative like p5 or processing or ml5 or things like that really will shape the things that you make and this is what i wanted to work on i wanted to work on these tools that help you be creative so Emoji Garden used this thing called Tracery.js, which I really, really love. It's made by Kate, Com Kate Compton, and it is a library for procedural, procedural art. So it doesn't, it's, it's basically very rule-based, um, but it's used a lot in generative stories or generating random levels um, that are sort of randomized but follow a particular part, pattern, exactly like Emoji Garden. Um, and the way the library works is very small and it's very easy to use, but it basically lets you define this pattern that shapes the world. Um, and I don't remember why I called it M. Honestly, I think it's because I'm a monster and it was like M for Monica. And that's basically like the things that you see in the world, like the leaves. Uh, and V is for visitor and S is for snack. So in that first row, you're going to get like some leaves, a visitor and a snack. And the way, you, the way you actually get things out of it is by specifying what your world looks like. So in here, the model or Monica or the monster, whatever you want to call it, is uh, a bunch of cactuses. And your visitors are like a hedgehog or a mouse or a bird. And they can eat leaves or clouds. I, I don't know, friends. I don't know what I was thinking. And that's basically all you have to specify. And then you give this pattern in this world to tracery, and it just goes through all of these tokens, and it substitutes a piece of the world randomly. So this is how you get, for example, a bunch of animals and a bunch of snacks, and everything else could be a, a, an empty space. Um, and this is how people like took it to build their weird worlds, because all they had to do was take my code and not look at anything about you know, spacing emoji on the page or any of the weird hacks that I had to do to get it displays nicely on on the on mobile or anything like that. All they had to do was change what this world looked like, and that's how all of the weird things happened, and that's why it was so successful. 
Um, and I was like, great, this was such a good experiment. I really want to be, be the person who like builds things like Tracery JS. And this builds a, brings us to my current job, which is on Magenta. So Magenta is this strange little team inside of Google Brain. Uh, and Google Brain is basically the area of Google that deals with a lot of the machine intelligence and machine learning research around the company. So it's, so Magenta is a team of like a bunch of like basically mathematicians, uh, machine learning researchers that like write a lot of really smart algorithms and a lot of models, but all of them happen to be related to generative art or generative music. And we're not a big team, we're like a small team of like five to 10 people, depending on what day you ask us. But that's what we do. We actually try to build things only for creativity. Because one of our mottos is to try to figure out what the role of machine learning in the creative process is. Uh, this is, by the way, my favorite glitchy slide because the words in machine learning are glitched as if the machine learning has failed and has decided to extend its creative process. And as a result, this presentation has become now an art experiment. So I love it. Art is whatever you want it to be. Um, right. So. We are trying to explore the role of machine learning in the creative process because machine learning is really useful for a lot of things. We use it to cure cancer cells or work on you know, self-driving cars or have things like my watch that remind me that maybe I should stand up every once in a while. And all of that is using a little bit of machine learning, but we want to use it to build weird, strange art brushes and musical instruments. And before we do anything, I want to explain machine learning in like three minutes. Because machine learning sounds really intimidating and complicated, and it really isn't. It's just a different kind of algorithm. So algorithms are basically functions. And my understanding is a whole bunch of you work on robotics, which is terrifying, and I don't understand it, how you make robots pick up balls and put them in like basketball hoops. And you, I've seen your videos. They're amazing. You do more programming than I do, honestly. So you've written functions. You know what functions are. They're things that take an input, like take something in and spit something out. So if you want a function that doubles a, num a number, it's f of x, where x is our input, and what it comes, what it spits out is like two times x. Um, that's a function, that's an algorithm. You can call it by the same name. This is a very simple one, obviously. It's slightly more complicated here. Like how do I get from here where I am right now in Tahoe, California to, I don't know, Sydney, Australia. That's a complicated function, but it's still a function that we can write. Um, your inputs in this case would be like my current location and your current location. Um, and there's an algorithm called Bellman Ford, for example, which is like super old and super boring and it looks like a different path. That's way, they're way better ones, but you know, these algorithms exist. But there's a class of functions that are a little bit hard to write the implementation for. Like, is this image that I'm gonna show you a photo of a dog or is it a photo of a cat? So when I give you a photo of a dog, this is not Hopper, um, it should say dog. And if I give you a photo of a cat, this is not Neelix, um, it should say cat. And I don't know how to do this, right? Like, do I go, well, if I look at these images, cats seem to have slightly beadier eyes and like they're close together and dogs seem to be really happy. And because I have one of each, I know that my experience is that dog, like cats look really disappointed in you, kind of like my mother. So I can like go down this path of trying to figure out what features define a dog and a cat. But the problem with this is that it's actually really brittle. And you end up with like hilarious algorithms that um, basically say that blueberry muffins are dog or chihuahuas because they look the same. They have the beady eyes, they have the beady nose, they've got the yellow background. So this is a terrible function. This is not how we write these kind of classifiers is what we call them. And this is where machine learning comes in. Machine learning is this basically magical way and it's not really magical, to figure out what your function is by just showing it a lot of examples. Like the punchline is, I don't know what the implementation of the function is, but I know that if I show you millions and millions of these examples, you can figure out the function yourself. So this is how it works. This is a function, uh, and in particular machine learning, we call it a model because it models something about the world. Um, and this is going to be a model that basically tells you whether something is a cat or a dog. And at the beginning, it doesn't know anything. It just like flips a random coin. So this is my dog Hopper and I go, hey model, is this a dog or a cat? And this model hasn't seen any examples before. It has no idea what a dog is. And it goes, is this a cat? And you're like, no silly, this is obviously a dog. Look at her, she's so cute. I had just given her a bath. Isn't she the greatest? Great. So the model goes, got it. And then I show her, I show the model a photo of my cat and I go, hey model, is this a photo of a cat? The model still doesn't really know. It's only seen a picture. But the only time I'd seen a picture, I told it it was a cat. So it goes, yes, I think it's a cat. 
and you're like, good job, model. It is a cat. You've got it right. It's very positive reinforcement going on here. And then you literally do this a million examples, like a million times. And I'm not joking about this. You literally show one of these models a million photos of cats and dogs, all of the cats and all of the dogs you can think about. And at the end of this, it goes, I got it, with fairly high confidence. When I show you a picture of Peekaboo, my coworker's dog, I think it's a dog. And you're like, you got it. This kind of model is called a classifier. And this is exactly how we train them. This is you basically train your very first machine learning model, if you haven't done it before. Um, and these models are great. They're the ones that basically you can use them for all sorts of things. Like you show it a photo of like a, re like a bottle and you go, is this recyclable or not? Or all sorts of things like that. So this is a classifier. The other kind of model that you maybe have heard me say this word a lot is called generative. And in a generative model, it learns to like draw these things. So rather than like looking at this photo of Hopper and a shark, it does it like it knows it's a dog, but more, more particularly, you go, hey model, draw me a dog, and it draws you these things. So these are the kind of models that we on the Magenta team work on. They're models that are able to produce music or are able to produce visual drawings or art. And for a long time, generative models sucked a lot. They were very bad, but they've gotten super good in the last couple of years for a lot of reasons, like machines have gotten faster. We've gotten a whole bunch of data sets. Um, this is, for example, our, our model called a music transformer um, that is able to produce uh, music that sort of sounds sort of jazzy. And that's just because it was trained on sort of classical jazzy sounding music. So here's a sample. it goes on and on and on and on because you never really ask it to stop um, and it sounds beautiful right like this is the kind of thing that you could put in the background in an elevator but this isn't the funnest thing that we can do because again remember if we go back to emojilate making thing making art or making music or making any of these projects in a void is really boring because humans can't really interact with it it's just like well great I can like listen to this but I didn't really contribute in any way to me to you know make it it's just random numbers so what we're specifically interested in is making music with me. I want something that, you know, I'm not a very good composer, but can help me compose things that I can feel I had agency in. I want a song that sounds just as good as that one, but I one Sunday morning woke up and I was like, I'm going to make this song and it's going to sound like this. So we want things more like this. This is an application called Incredible Spinners and you can play with it. They, all of these run on the web. It's made by uh, somebody named Taro. And it's using one of the Magenta JS models. So it's a JavaScript app that you can play with. And he made this really strange instrument where all of these little quadrants are little melodies. So as you move sideways, the melody changes. But as you move up and down, the key that the melody is in changes. So you can sort of create and compose your song by just navigating this, this grid like this. And that's a great app because that's like a weird, strange instrument we didn't have before. Um, this is the Bach Doodle that you may have seen and it came out uh, last year for Bach's birthday. Uh, if you still Google it, you can still find it and play with it. But the idea here is that you write a little melody. This one sounds like da -na, da -da -da, da -da 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 -da, which is a Romanian folk song. Um, and you pass it to this machine learning model and it generates these like three extra voices that make a Bach chorale, basically. So it sounds very like Bach-y when you listen to it. We also make strange, uh, sort of, again, strange instruments. This is a model called Piano Genie um, that you can play online. So it also has a JavaScript app. Um, but basically, it learns how to create classical sounding pieces. But instead of you playing 88 keys on a piano, you just play eight, the eight that you're looking at. And it sounds like this. I've memorized all of these songs. I've listened to them so much. And the fun thing about this Piano Genie is that not only does it sound fun, 
when you see the piano moving, but you can make all sorts of weird things with it. So we made Free Genie. This is the app, and uh, if you go to it, so it's like freegenie.glitch.me, uh, pianogenie.glitch.me, sorry, I should have put the link in. Um, but you can connect it to a Makey Makey, if you have a Makey Makey around the house, and then you can stick the wires into broccoli, or a, an apple, things that I stole from my house, so that you can, you know, compose this broccoli sonata. It's not broccoli, it's Brussels sprouts. absurd thing it's clearly fun uh fun to play around with but you might say you know this is not a real instrument this is not real music but that's just because we haven't tried to produce real music uh yacht on the other hand yacht is a band that we really love and they've uh made an entire album with machine learning so their album is called chain tripping uh and this is a uh a generated art using a model called a gan um and it generates i think this is like a fan um and all of their album art is generated a lot of their music is generated with samples from uh one of these magenta models where they again had rules to make sure that the music still sounded like them they could uh, delete notes and they could choose what instruments they were played on but they couldn't add any of their human notes to them they had to work with what the model gave them so this is one of their songs uh Welcome to your pleasure. just don't make out and I'm not gonna play it so that we don't get copyright infringed. But their video was uh, we was using these like generative images that were done with a font that was completely machine learning generated. And their song, if you listen to them, sounds like a real song. It sounds exactly what Yacht's older albums looked like. And this is my favorite part, where like in their liner notes, where you usually think you know your producer and your creative direction. They they thanked all of the models that they used, and it's an entire page of models. Um, for their lyrics that were also machine learning generated. So I think that's incredibly fun because this is an awesome and creative application of machine learning. And this is the kind of things we want to see in the world. These were a lot of music examples. Maybe you don't care about music, valid. But you can also do visual art. Um, this is a little thing that basically applies a style from one painting onto a different photo. So this is Einstein. Um, and you're like, well, what if he looked like the scream? And you can upload these two photos and then bam, you get the screaming Einstein. What if you wanted to look like Monet? This is what it would look like as Monet. This is like the fan, the world's fanciest Instagram filter that's all powered by machine learning in Magenta JS. Um, there's also this silly app that I really love called Magic Sketchpad, um, where this model knows how to draw things. It's based on like, the quick draw data set, where basically we asked millions of people to like draw a cat or a dog or a lamp or anything like that. And from this, we basically reverse engineer it in engineer it so that we can have a model that knows how to draw a cat or a dog or a lamp or something like that. So in this sketch pad, you draw a circle, and then because we're drawing cats, the model is going to continue drawing cats. And then you can be like, sweet, now I want to draw a crab, and it continues it, and it looks like a crab. This is a tractor, a truck, it looks, it gets wheels, it's out of the screen, because I don't put the slide correctly. Here's a whale. Um, and you might be like, this isn't real art, Monica, and I agree with this, but you could you could take it and you could make art of it. You could like put another model that knows how to paint or things like that. And all of these are built with Magenta JS. And Magenta JS is a JavaScript library that we try to keep incredibly easy and incredibly straightforward to use because we wanted really creative people to use it that maybe were not the most uh, you know, advanced machine learning researchers. So if you want to just hear random samples, for example, you would just create one of these models after you load the script, you ask it to give you a sample, you create a player that knows how to play music in a browser, and you give it that, that sequence to the player, and then you hear it out. And this isn't like pseudocode or anything like that, even though I know it looks like pseudocode. This is actual JavaScript code that you would write to be able to use music that was generated by a machine learning model. Um, remember Piano Genie, that magical like eight button or fruit for Brussels sprouts combination? Again, that was even simpler. You create one of these models and then you tell it, listen, I pressed the third button and I want it to be this random. And that's like a number, like 0 0.1 or 0 0.7. And then it gives you back the note that you should play. And that's how the sounds come out. And the reason why we did this and the reason why we're making this library that, you know, my parents don't usually get, they're like, shouldn't you been working on like fixing elevators or cancer or anything like that is because we really think that code should never hold back art. 
there's a lot of artists out there who are brilliant and have these brilliant ideas that, you know, years, like 20 years from now, we're going to look back and be like, they were absolutely revolutionary. But at the moment, we require them to also be incredibly, incredibly talented machine learning engineers. And that's silly. That's not how art has been historically made. If you think about somebody like I, that I really love, like Degas, and he, he was a chalk pastel artist. So he, you know, painted all these ballerinas with chalk, basically. But he didn't make his own chalk. He paid a very rich French man called Sennelier, who was really good at making these chalk pastels. Um, and he would make the pastels for Degas, and Degas would make the art. Sennelier didn't make the art. He just made the, the, uh, the chalk pastels. Artists like Yo-Yo Ma don't make their own cellos. They would sound like a pan in your kitchen. They use cellos from like the 1800s that strange music engineers have built for them. And the same thing should happen with visual art and with, you know, generated musical art in the same way. So I'm going to show you these two art installations, real art installations, not, not like just the joke ones that I've showed you recently, um, that really, in my opinion, are like so moving and mind blowing. This is called Memories of a Passerby. And this is this, it's this room by Mario Klingemann where when you walk into it, it generates you a random painting, a random portrait of a person. And if you look at them, they're classically painted oil paintings, basically, that they look at. And this installation wouldn't be possible without machine learning because there's no way that a human painter could spend their entire life to generate infinitely many uh, paintings. It would generate something like a thousand paintings and they would die and then the installation would end. But because this installation is used with like machine learning and models that know how to learn to generate these things, it produces this beautiful thing where like forever and ever you will get these random portraits that you can look at. This is my favorite one. It's called Peeping Skulls by Robbie Barrett and Ronan Barrow. These are different people, same names. Robbie Barrett is an uh, AI artist. So he built a lot of visual art with machine learning and he trains these models and he's a, a really good AI engineer. Ronan Barrett is a physical painter. He paints with oils and they teamed together and they took a whole bunch of like Ronan Barrett's art. So a whole bunch of paintings of oil skulls and trained a machine learning model that learned how to paint skulls like Ronan Barrett did. And what happens in this art installation is that you walk to it and then you look through this little peeping hole and it tells you that it's going to generate you a skull. It's a skull that hasn't been seen before. And once you look at it, it's going to last for 10 seconds. So this is a skull that's upside down if you want to rotate your head to look at it. And you've got like 10 seconds to look at it and then it gets deleted forever. So it's marked in the machine learning model in such a way that never again would this particular skull be generated. And again, this wouldn't be possible. You don't have 10 seconds to paint this like amazing skull for somebody in particular. And I used to give this talk last year and it was really moving then because I was like, oh man, in this weird Instagram world where everybody's like sort of online, but not together, we have this art experiment where like we're sort of physically together, but like art apart because we can't look at what we're sharing. And I think it's even more special now in the pandemic where like I'm talking to people in Sydney who are like awake at un ungodly hours. Um, and we're not in the same room together. I'm in a weird room with bunk beds, but we're all sharing this experience. And I think we can use a lot of machine learning to generate more of these awesome and wild experiences that we haven't had before, just because we have these powers to generate a lot of the same kinds of art. And this is what the talk is really about, because I do think that there's such a value for some of us to work on these really serious things like magenta and tracery and machine learning that is targeted at silly things so that people like Ron and Barrett can make these wonderfully charming art installations that you can approach for 10 seconds and get your personalized skull that goes away and disappears into existence forever. That's it, thank you. Um, this is where a lot of my links live. This is my pets, this is me. I'm not Waldorf on Twitter if you wanna ever ask me any questions. And that's it, let me switch back to the Zoom. All right. So thank you for that cool presentation. That was really cool. Learned a lot of things about AI all together. Um, Yay! So, <laughs> so we do have some questions now. Um, so first question, what was your inspiration for trying to create your emoji garden? Like how did you think of the idea and what led to the creation? Um, so it was, that's a very good question. It was two things. First of all, I was in the emoji phase. So I was like, I can only produce things with emoji. So that part straightforward. 
And I was at work. So I spent like, you know, most of my life, like every other sad adult uh, at a desk that I have some cute things on, but I don't really have plants on because I forget to water them. I was like, wouldn't it be nice if I could just have a garden that never died because they never had to water it? And I was like, man, I have emoji. I should make an emoji garden. And that's what happened. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, a second question. It's kind of a, a fun question. Um, what was your favorite or the best generative AI project that you've ever seen? That I've ever seen is definitely the Peeping Skull ones. Like, I am genuinely obsessed with it. And I don't know if I'm ever going to see it in real life. And it makes me incredibly sad. Um, so it's really, so I really love visual art. So I love all of these like really weird art artifacts that come out of machine learning art. Uh, so I like looking at those. Um, but I also, I mean, from like a really practical stance, the fact that a band used machine learning to like generate lyrics and song and like performs now what I call robot generated music, sort of. Because, like, they worked, like, hundreds of hours on the music, obviously. But, like, the fact that this is, I've seen them in concert and they play songs that I know have come from, like, a little bit of something that I worked on. So I think that's, like, the, the closest I will ever be to, you know, being close to fame. All right. Um, next question. So it's kind of um, out of topic. But what's it like to work at Google? It's really great. It's really strange now because I keep, you know, working with the dog. Um, Google is really fun because uh, it's sort of, they figure out this thing where like adults really like to be taken care of a lot. Um, like they feed me, they give me coffee, all of my needs are met. So it's really fun. Um, but in particular, I really like working at Google because they let me work on things that I'm passionate about. So I've been at Google for seven years. Uh, and I've only been on Magenta for two years. And I used to work on, you know, Chrome the browser. And then I worked on a library called Polymer. But two years ago, I discovered this weird team that makes music with machine learning. And I was like, shit, I, sorry. Uh, I was like, I love making things with machine learning. Uh, I want to be on your team because it sounds amazing. And there's teams, I've seen a team at Google who, like, takes a photo of, uh, I, I wear glasses, you can't see it now, but I wear glasses and I have to go to the eye doctor a lot and they have a team that works on uh, this machine where you can take a photo of at home of your eye and then it tries to like tell you any like really alarming uh, medical conditions, like do you have diabetes maybe? Because that's a thing that we can tell from photos of your eye. I've seen a team that like makes physical uh, sort of like reactive uh, clothing. So you have like this hoodie where like, you know how your hoodie has a strap that strap like reacts to touch. So like we have a dream of making an instrument out of it. So there are so many like teams that work on these like weird brain children of theirs um, that I really like and are only really possible in like a really big team because I hate to break it to you, but uh, making uh, algorithms that generate music does not a salary pay. So uh, this would not work if I were not employed by a big company. All right, um, this is a very important question. What's your favorite emoji? Oh, so this is such a polarizing question. My favorite emoji no longer exists. So you can delete an emoji, but you can, but companies like Apple or Google that basically make the emoji fonts can change what those fonts look like. So my favorite emoji version is the dancing lady, but in the Android blob versions. So remember when like Android had like the really ugly blobs that everybody hated. However, the dancing lady was this like sassy blog that sassy blob that had legs and had like a rose in its mouth and it was just like doing this move and I was like that is the that is my vision board. I want to be this this emoji cared about nothing. It was like not wearing clothes, not really good looking, was enjoying itself and I was like that is that is it. So that is to date my favorite emoji and I have it as a sticker and I want it to come back. Uh, but otherwise, all the animals are, like, deadly cute. I worked on the otter emoji, so now it's my favorite. I worked on the otter proposal, so the reason why I have an otter on your phone is because me and my friend Jane, the linguist, we wrote that proposal. Oh, that emoji is actually my favorite one. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next question. Um, in your opinion, what is STEAM and its importance today? What is STEAM? Yeah. So STEAM science, technology, engineering, and 
Got it. STEM. STEM. I get it. Sorry, I heard STEAM and I was like, like the gaming platform? Because it keeps me sane. Um, I think, so STEM is super near and dear to my heart because I'm obviously somebody who like lives in STEM. Like I wouldn't exist if STEM didn't exist. Um, and whenever I think about its important, importance, I think that like we, I have a car that like can technically summon itself. And it's really nice, not because it can summon itself, but because it also knows other things. Like it helps me drive better because it tells me when things are in my blind spot. And I am living up to the woman's stereotype. I'm a terrible driver because I don't actually change my blind spots. So if you didn't have all of these fields that are like, how can we apply science and how can we apply technology to like physical problems that people have, we'd be screwed. We'd like still be riding the same bicycle that we had like gas power, I don't know, steam powered trains. Um, so I think this is super important to like think about maybe fields where like technology isn't obvious, like music and art and be like, well, how can we make it actually useful? How can we make somebody that maybe doesn't know how to play music? How can we help them learn music without like sitting them to like music theory classes one on one for like a year and be like, have you learned about chords? So this is super important to me. And also like diversity in STEM is really important to me because I think that like, sorry to, you know, shit on you, but if you only have white men working in it, then you're going to get all sorts of, like, weird products that, like, are only targeted to white men and forget that, like, everybody else exists. Like, we've had so many bad examples. Like, I think the first generation of, like, smartwatches were, like, I can detect other skins that are in pasty white. I don't know why. So it's very important. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, next question. How can you encourage more girls to get involved in STEM? That's, I mean, giving talks like this online, this is part of the reason why I go around the world giving talks um, is because when I was growing up, I was really lucky that I had a lot of like female role models in tech. Like my mother is a programmer. She used to work on like air traffic control systems. When I grew up in Romania, a place actually has a fair bit of diversity in STEM because a lot of girls just see other women doing it. Uh, and then I moved to Canada and America and I was like, where did everybody go? Like they're, they're stopping women. And I think that like really defeats you as like a young, you know, a young woman or a young girl who's like, nobody looks like me. Why would I, why, why am I being told to go into this field where nobody looks like me? So I think it's super important if you are uh, somebody like me who enjoys giving talks and like, I like talking about my work going around and be like, hello child. I know that it doesn't seem like you can work on this, but I promise you absolutely can. Um, so this is one of the things that I do. I also try to like, when I was in Montreal, I used to organize a meeting where like no men were allowed. It was just a meeting for women in tech. Uh, this was like six years ago when a lot of these meetings didn't exist. Um, and everybody had like such positive feedback where they were like, I didn't, I couldn't name you 40 women developers in Montreal, but now there's so many of them. So I think just finding your people and then encouraging them. And once you have them, so like if you're a big company that like hires these women, you know, treat them well. Like, just because you finally, like, met your diversity quota doesn't mean you can, like, slack off and be like, I have diversity now. I no longer need to, like, promote these women or make sure that they're enjoying their job. So it's hard. Give talks. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, another question. What projects would you like to work on next? So I am super excited because the thing that I'm working on next is actually not about generative music. Um, because the world is kind of on fire and I can't really get over it about how like there's so much horrible things going on everywhere and I can't really help fix them. So the next thing that I'm working on is um, a project with something called the Trevor Project in, uh, in America and they're a lovely nonprofit uh, organization that works with LGBTQ teens who are at risk of like suicide or self-harm. So I'll be working with them for the next six months to figure out like ways in which we can use machine learning to sort of like help them train more counselors or help them sort of surface more appropriate information at appropriate times. So that's, I'm really sad to leave music for six months, but I also think it's like really important that if you get this opportunity to sort of like try to do a little tiny nugget of good in the world, then I'm sure music will let me come back uh, when I want to. And I also hope that this is going to like give me in my spare time, like free ideas because having to work on, creative things for a living means that I'm like burnt out of ideas like I have reached a place where I can no longer generate creative ideas yeah um next questions what would you There's say to art sorry 
These are such great questions. <laughs> yeah, it's from a lot of different people. Yeah. <laughs> Next question, what would you say to artsy students who are interested in working on projects like the ones you just shown? I think that if you are interested in coding, there's a place for you. I think that it's really important to find, I, I struggle with this because like on one hand, I really want everybody to be a programmer, but on the other hand, I know that if you're like a person who really enjoys making art, like programming will kill your soul. So I don't want you to go down there and spend like two days trying to like debug this like off by one error that is the reason why your art is coming out terribly. So I do think that like one of the exciting things are like collaborations between artists and engineers. So find somebody in your group, these like brilliant robotics geniuses that we have, um, you know, pair up with them and make a little robot that instead like, instead of like, sinking the ball into the tube it can like paint something for you and that'd be wonderful um so i think find somebody who's like equally passionate about it and then like combine your skills to make this like amazing voltron of like you provide the art direction and they provide the engineering direction and you make something awesome yeah um oh this is also important how can we follow your personal awesome works oh uh twitter if you are allowed on Twitter, I don't know who's allowed on, oh my goodness. Um, how old are you all? What is like being a child nowadays? Back in my day, we didn't have electricity, I'm kidding. Um, so I am at not Waldorf on Twitter, uh, where I'm fairly nice. Uh, I respond to emails, so if you find my personal site, I will always respond to emails, especially if they're like, uh, if they come from somebody who looks like a human being, not like a VC who's like, I am uh, trying to revolutionize the golf industry. Um, so I. I'm bad at replying to emails, but I always reply to emails, especially if they're like questions like this. Um, if you're ever in San Francisco, if you were ever allowed out of the house again and you're in San Francisco, we can have a coffee. Yep, um, these are kind of off topic, but why is your dog named Hopper? My dog is named Hopper because, uh, first of all, I'm a giant nerd and Grace Hopper is a brilliant human being who changed the world and without her we wouldn't have you and me talking on a computer right now both because computers wouldn't work and both because women wouldn't know that they should do this and second of all because my favorite painter is named Edward Hopper uh, and between this two comments my boyfriend likes to think that it's also because of Dennis Hopper the actor but he is uh, that is revisionist history so but we'll allow it and also he hops away. She's a golden retriever. All she does is like try to jump on people. Yeah, that's a perfect name then. <laughs> um, next question. What's your favorite meal at Google? My favorite meal? Oh, so this is a great question. Sometimes they have an ice cream mochi bar and you know what an ice cream mochi is? It's like the ice cream is at, yeah. And they always come in like four different flavors and I try not to eat dessert at work because I also don't do any exercise. But when it's like the ice cream mochi bar, I swear to God, I eat like an average of 10. And I'm not kidding. Like I just go to town and I'm like, well, force myself to eat the kale and then just fill my plate with ice cream mochi and it's really unhealthy. Um, but the, but in all seriousness, the back when we had meals, I haven't left my house, you guys, in like three months. Um, they're, the meals are super healthy, and in particular, there's a cafe that's very vegetarian friendly. So last year, I became a vegetarian, and it's kind of hard to go from like 33 years of eating eat meats to like not eating meat at all. And they have so many like smart and healthy vegetarian meals where like you don't. It's not a salad. It's like a stew, a curry, or something like that. Where like I would never make it at home because I'm I'm lazy. So the fact that like they feed me in a way that like keeps me alive and healthy is probably my favorite part, but also really the mochi part. Yeah, who doesn't like ice cream or mochi? Correct. Uh, <laughs> um, next question. How did you get started in computer science? I like to think that I was born into it. So again, I grew up in Romania. Both of my parents were programmers. Most of my family is programmers. I was forced to do math from like a baby age. Uh, I went to a programming middle school. So like in grade five, I had programming classes. And then I had these dreams of becoming an architect. And in all honesty, my mother, bless her soul, was like, you're not that talented. And I don't think you're going to have a good career as like kind of a below average architect. Um, but I was like good at programming. So I was like, sure, I'll give it a try. And then it took, a, it took a while. Like I'm now in my 30s. It took a while to figure out 
what kind of programming I'm passionate about. Like I worked for a bank for a while and that wasn't the greatest. So it's like a, but I'm now really happy that I did it. I don't, I can't imagine myself doing anything else. Yeah. Uh, next question. What's your favorite project that you ever worked on? My favorite project that I've ever worked on. Oh, like for fun or for money? Wow, it depends. Yeah. Okay. For, uh, for fun, I think anything that I've worked on Magenta has been so satisfying because our models make good sounds and then you can give in to people and be like, listen, we have this thing called Drumbot that I made last year that I think is one of my favorites where um, you basically can plug like a MIDI keyboard in it and you can play a little loop and it generates uh, matching drums for it that sort of sound humanized. So if you're a musician who's like a singer songwriter and you're like, I don't have a drum or a friend with me, you can in theory like bring this to like a little jam session and have like free drums which is kind of amazing because it's like a free way, like literally it's like free as in beer, like no money, um, to have drums, like an extra instrument. So that was really fun. In terms of like art, like the thing that I, I love the most that I've ever made that I hate, like, and by I love the most, I mean I hated the least, is uh, Midi City 2000. I think that's the one where like I made it. I'm like, oh man, I'm never going to top this. And it's true, I haven't. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think this would be the last question. Um, what should high school students today be doing to prepare for a career in technology or STEM? For sure, that's a great question. I think one of the worst things that happened to me in school is that we teach programming really boringly, or at least like they did when in my generation. Like it was all of this like, let's learn, I don't know, visual basic to like add two numbers together. And like, Kids these days, like, are brought up on Instagram and are brought up on TikTok and, like, on the internet. Don't make them do incredibly boring things, which is why I'm really passionate about, like, processing or P5JS or anything in JavaScript that's, like, you get such, like, instant gratification from making it and it's visual and you can share it with all of your friends. You can, like, I've seen JavaScript on TikTok, you guys, where people, like, talk about the Chrome dev tools. Like, this is how you know you've made it. So I think... It's really important for like anybody who wants for this to succeed to think about it, like not how we were taught about it, like make a file system or whatever, but like make these creative art applications because once you're able to like, I don't know, make a robot that can like draw, you can make anything in the world. I promise you, nothing is really that hard. Everything's like a variation of the same thing. So if you can get kids not to be bored and actually care about programming and not make it sound like this awful boring thing your parents do, then I think you've got it. Yeah, I think that's really important too. Yeah, um, we do have more questions. Um, so, what do you have any advice for robot kids like me um, to work at Google? Oh my God, I don't know. I would hire all of you. I still genuinely do not understand, and I have like a master's in machine learning. How you make robots do anything? Like, I do not understand. Um, I think that so a lot of like working at Google is just playing a game like once you once you want to interview you have to like do the studying like you do for any exam that you don't really care about you study there's like these questions you're going to do like an exam basically where you like program on a board whatever but in general just figuring out what you like because there's even though google sounds really awesome there's still like boring jobs at google right like it's a we have seventy thousand employees not every team is great um, not every project that I think is great, other people think is great. Like, there's a whole bunch of people who don't think that generative music is fun. They're like, why would you ever work on that? I'm solving a much bigger problem. So I think figuring out what you like and what you don't like in a project, maybe work somewhere else before Google. This is actually a thing that I did where I worked for a bank before working for Google. Um, and I think that both gave me, like, the strength to like know what other places are like and not sort of like blow all of my excitement uh, up front and then just know that like I really hate these kind of teams I should look for this do internships internships are cool internships are a thing that kids do yeah yeah that really helped thank you um another question what are you doing to stay busy during the shelter in place Oh, I do not have this problem, friends. I stay busy. I would, if you gave me 24 hours, I would sleep for 16 of them. And then I do every single craft in the universe. So currently 
I'm one of these people who can't pay attention until, unless I do something with my hands. Like if I'm in a meeting and I'm not doing something with my hands, I'll just like work on email or start coding. So I'm currently doing needle felting where you basically take wool and then you stab it with a needle a lot of times and it makes like balls and then you can shape them into things. So I recently made like a bird and a cactus. I've watched uh, all 15 seasons of Criminal Minds in my spare time. I play a lot of Animal Crossing, a lot of Animal Crossing. My island is dope. It is so good. I've played like 360 hours of Animal Crossing. I do not have a problem keeping busy, friends. <laughs> yes, Animal Crossing is pretty cool. <laughs> um, another question, when you first started programming, was it thing you truly enjoyed right away or did it take some time for you to get used to it or get into it? I think it definitely took some time. So I really like video games. And um, I was super lucky because like when I first learned programming, it was like on something called QBasic, which whatever. But it came with like these three games. It was basically like a snake game and a gorillas game where you got to like hit somebody else with a banana. It was like one of those like arch calculation basically games. And my mom, a few ideas that were really brilliant in her life. And this was one of them where... Um, she basically taught me where the code for those lived, so I got to hack it. And I would like, I would make myself gain a life every time I died in the snake game. I would make the other person like not really be able to hit me. So I think that part was really fun and I really enjoyed it. But then I had to do programming in school and it really, I did not really love it. And this is why I wanted to like not do it for a living. Um, and then I finally like got this. I started like figuring out that what I like is art and just because I'm not a professional artist doesn't mean I can't use the things that I do at work for art. So now I do like a lot of, you know, a lot of for loops, honestly, it's not like advanced programming, but like I generate a lot of like images based on some weird kind of data. Um, and that's something that I really like. And it took a while. It took a while. And like, you know, what is your passion project is not necessarily obvious at first. But yours is because I mean you make robots, so I didn't have robots. I'm so upset I didn't have robots. I didn't have, I have like Lego mind storms, whatever they're called. Yeah, you guys are killing it. Make robots, friends. Oh, thank you. All right, this is a question for me. Do you think um, creativity is really important in STEM? Yes, I do, because I think that if you don't encourage creativity, you get very boring solutions. I think a lot of the things that um, I'm not a fan of Elon Musk bless his soul, but I do think he's a wildly creative person because if he hadn't been around, we wouldn't have thought about the things that Teslas can do. Um, and I think that you can see this in like his personality where he's like, I have these ideas. And I think that if you don't encourage people to be creative, don't give them a space to be creative, or they're allowed to like, maybe suggest these absolutely dumb ideas that maybe probably won't work. But if you allow them to ask these questions, then you're definitely going to get these like, super creative things that weren't possible. I think a lot of the weird sciences that we have are because somebody was like, but what if, and hear me out, what if I do this weird thing that nobody tells me that I should do? What if I do it? And to me, that is creativity. And that's really important. Oh no, I think that's you made it. <laughs> yeah, that's some cool things you told us there. I think that's the end of this session. Thank you so much for this presentation. That was really Thank interesting. Thank you so much for letting me share this little internet hour with you. I oh, hope it was good. fun. It was really fun. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Bye. Bye. Good luck with the rest. Thank you.